Earlier today, we heard from Russian President Vladimir Putin in his first major news conference since he invaded Ukraine nearly two years ago. With Western media there in attendance, the Russian leader confidently predicted that Russia will outlast Western support for Ukraine. Today, Ukraine produces almost nothing. They are trying to preserve something, but they produced almost nothing. They get everything, excuse the bad manners, for free. But this freebie may end someday, and apparently it is ending. This highly choreographed call-in show from the Kremlin lasted over four hours. It ranged from acknowledging, for the first time, an American journalist who is wrongfully being held in Russia to the price of eggs. Joining me here tonight, Time correspondent Simon Schuster, who covers Ukraine and Russia, also the author of The Showman, Inside the Invasion That Shook the World and Made a Leader of Vladimir Zelensky. Thank you for being here. I mean, to listen to this marathon press conference, obviously one of the biggest takeaways as we're watching this fight in Washington over funding for Ukraine is he very clearly thinks that it's about to be over. He does, yeah. And, and it was a very confident Putin. Um, I, I think he has reason to be pretty sure of himself. Um, but what I took away just watching, watching the events today was this amazing split screen, uh, you know, with Putin on the one hand, trying to get across to his people that we need to be uh, in this war for the long haul. We're, we're facing the West. We're, we're in a kind of existential battle with the West and preparing them for a kind of forever war, uh, an almost cult of war. And then on the other hand, you had um, President Zelensky able to tell his people, look, the European Union is opening uh, membership talks with us. So I, I think the visions that the two leaders today presented to their people were so dramatically different. One is is able to tell his people at least, look, at the end of this long, horrific war, we do have an opportunity to live in prosperity with the European Union. They are opening the door to us. And Putin is only talking about continued confrontation with the West. Uh, and any time that he sees a bit of reason to feel confident, he continues to, to go back to these um, really dramatic stakes, really dramatic demands of swallowing basically all of Ukraine, demilitarizing Ukraine, and confronting the West for, for years and years to come. Yeah, as he's talked about, you know, we've heard Republicans talking about a negotiated settlement. I mean, he made clear he's not looking to make any any concessions. The other interesting moment was where you saw, you know, two Putins on screen. You know, there's been all these questions about his health, whether or not he uses a body double, which obviously it was something that he was trying to reference. I mean, what did you make of him showing this, the real Putin on the left and then the AI-generated version on the right? I mean, he's clearly trying to, to say, I'm not using a body, body double, I'm in good health, I'm fine. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of trolling. Uh, I, I think, you know, the idea that he uses a body double or that he has cancer or, or some other grave illness that he might soon croak and then this whole war will be resolved by itself you know, I think it's it's a it's a it's a fanciful topic. It's it's often discussed in, in the kind of um, you know in Ukraine in the Ukrainian blogosphere. Um, I think he was just trying to point out that no, people, I'm in this for the long haul. Don't count on me to kind of step aside or or get ill or fall away. I'm I'm going to keep fighting you uh, every chance I get. For also for the first time, we saw him acknowledge that they are holding Evan Gershkovich, and you know it's been 260 days now that the Wall Street Journal reporter has been being held. He said that there's a dialogue between U.S. officials and Russian officials, but talked about it being a challenging conversation. What is that? How do you read into that? What does that mean, do you think? Well, I'm, I'm really glad that my colleague from The New York Times, Valerie Hopkins, was able to put that question to him, to his face, mm -hmm. and make him uh, speak on that issue. Uh, you know, I think, I think we're all really concerned about Evan Gershkovich and, and the negotiations to release him. You know, I think the way Putin answered it gave me the sense that he kind of enjoys at least on, on this issue, uh, being able to needle the, the United States. Uh, the United States wants something from him. They want Evan to be set free, as he should be. And, and Putin uh, seems to be in no hurry to release him. Apparently, he enjoys uh, having these kinds of you know, negotiations and debates with the United States, haggling over hostages and so on. Th this is a place he feels comfortable. And not just him, Paul Whelan as well, who was yep, obviously yep. also brought up in that. Simon Schuster, can't wait to read the book. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Steve Hall is a CNN national security analyst and former CIA chief of Russia operations, and he joins us now. Steve, great to have you back on the show. Uh, I mean, let's start off with, with the fact that he... He brought it back. He brought the conference back, the end of your conference back after two years of war, engaging, as he normally does, in a four-hour marathon. 
What does that tell us? I mean, Bianca, I don't know if you heard her there, she, she was talking about how this shows that he's confident. How do you see it? Well, he's, I mean, you know, back in the battle days of the Cold War, uh, Russia watchers, criminologists used to watch the various Russian politicians stand on top of Lenin's tomb, and they would count very carefully how many of them there were and, you know, where they were standing in relationships. And that's pretty much really, this is the modern version of that. We, we get to watch Putin. This is, of course, highly orchestrated. Very, very little of actually what comes through is actually uh, legitimate questions. I mean, these are all screened or, or pre-prepared. And in that sense, it's interesting to see what those questions are because they're essentially reflective of what the Kremlin wants to talk about. So you had some cases where you had, you know, um, you know, little old ladies out in the countryside complaining about the price of eggs, which allows Putin to say, you know, well, you know, I have these bad economic advisors, but I have your own interests in heart. And indeed, he apologized. When it comes yeah, to the I... Ukraine war, he was able to say, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. When it comes to the Ukraine war? When it comes to the Ukraine war, he was able to say some things that were very important for him to say. For example, no, there's not going to be any more, you know, call-ups, call military call-ups for young men. Uh, that's at least what he claimed. Whether or not that's going to happen or whether there are other, uh, other mechanisms, hard to say. He clearly feels more confident, though, simply because he didn't, you know, he had it this year and he decided not to do it last year. Yeah, and even after these, you know, these two years, it does seem that his strategy, if it hasn't changed at all, he's still using the same old justifications that we've been hearing the last two years for the war. Denazification, right, the demilitarization, what he calls the neutral status. How does this play at home? Because just this week, if our viewers just remind our viewers, a U.S., a classified U.S. intelligence report estimated that 315,000 Russian soldiers had been either killed or wounded since the war began. So this is really interesting because I think the Kremlin is having to wrestle with the new reality of how Russians get their news. Still, the vast majority of them, especially those that are away from uh, highly concentrated uh, uh, you know, populations like Moscow and St. Petersburg, they still watch television largely or listen to the radio. And that is completely controlled uh, by the Kremlin. But now you've got a lot of these telegram channels and all these yeah. other online capabilities. So he's got to consider both of those things. He, got to, he has to speak to both rural Russians where he addresses their very basic issues. And he's got to address a more sophisticated audience in, in St. Petersburg, Moscow, and maybe uh, you know places like Yekaterinburg, where he's got to talk about how the war is going. And of course, he's going to paint a very positive picture to keep people as, as under control as he possibly can. And I think we've got video of some, we've got a little graphic actually, Steve, that shows some of those kind of rogue questions uh, that appear just be, uh, as he was talking. Um, and those questions, as we can see on, on the screen, when will Russians stop killing Russians? When will the real Russia not differ from television Russia? Why do we have so many poor? I mean, these clearly do not tow the kind of Kremlin li line. But how do you interpret it? Because like, like you said, Steve, the, in your first answer, I think, these are often, these conferences are often very choreographed. Yeah, and again, it's a real balance that, that Putin has to strike. I mean, he, he, he understands that the only way to make sure that the zero questions that he doesn't want to talk about gets through, he's, they've, his, the security services and you know, the local television services, all of which are under control, of course, of the security service, uh, services, would have to do amazing work to stop all of yeah. Russia from being able to weigh in. By the same token, Putin wants to appear uh, that yeah. he you know, is able to, to, to field those questions because he's strong enough to do so. It's a real balancing act for him. That's such a good point. And we have seen this week, and I'm sure our viewers that have seen, Russian state TV, uh, I'm sure you've seen this as well, Steve, commenting on, on the political gridlock that we've seen on Capitol Hill, the, the, the inability of the US to unlock those funds for Ukraine. I want just to play out a little clip and we can talk after this. Have a listen to this. What's happening in the US is beneficial for us. Ukraine is losing. Russia is winning. This is it. Their funding and weapons came to an end. As of now, well done, Republicans. They're standing firm. That's good for us. Even Mitch McConnell, well done, Gramps. Well done, Gramps. I mean, is this dithering, this political dithering? I mean, is playing right into Putin's hands, Steve? Yes, it is. Um, he will take all of those messages, all of those sound bites that he that his propagandists, who are those people that we were just watching, are looking for coming out of both Washington and, of course, uh, European capitals, if it plays the way Putin wants wants it to. And his propagandists simply put that out there because, again, it transmits to the Russian people that, oh, look, 
The only reason that Ukraine is still alive as a country is because of these external, this external assistance that, that they're getting from the United States and from the, and from the Europeans. To the extent that he can say, look, that goodwill is running out, and that means the war is going to end, and we're going to accomplish everything that we need to. It's good news for Russia. Yeah, he'll he'll take that to the bank every day. Steve Hall, always great to get your analysis and expertise. Thank you, Steve.